Sweet. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I hope it was awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be taking you through how to get started with React and specifically, like, when not to. So I've had a bit of React native experience and I've tried a couple of different things. So I'm going to show you my experience and kind of some new conclusions that I've got that I got as a as a result of that experience. Um, can <laughs> can I get a show of hands? Who has actually done some native development before? L little bit. I know. I know you have. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Cool. Who wants to do native development? Awesome. Okay. Cool. Um, and who wants somebody else to do native development for them? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Sweet. So, um, sweet. So React Native is pretty cool, and I came across it because once upon a time I needed a mobile app, or rather, a buddy of mine needed a mobile app, and I was like, sweet, this this doesn't seem too far fetched. I can do this, and so React Native seemed like the right choice for me for a bunch of different reasons. So, firstly, like the app that I needed, it needed to wake up, uh, kind of like an alarm clock. So how many people here have Android devices? OK, cool. So I, I, I don't know what the iOS alarm clock is like too much, but with the Android one, like your phone, the whole screen wakes up, and it does a whole lot of things, and there's buttons and widgets and moving things and uh, noises. And so I needed that kind of functionality in another app. So what that meant um, is that I needed to use this thing called um, the Android Alarm Manager. I just needed to support Android. So iOS should have its own thing. Um, Android has, has this one. Um, and what's interesting about this is that you can't actually access it from like a web API or anything like that. You have to hook into it natively. And so that kind of crossed out a lot of potential um, solutions for me. And then the last thing, which is the best thing, is that, that I have this existing skill set. I think React and Redux is so and Sagas is like super fun. Um, I enjoy it. I have the skills. I was like, let me use that. Um, like Learning a whole new language and skill set for this little dinky app didn't make a lot of sense. So I was like, OK, cool. React Native has to be the way to go. And so, so I started that journey. But before I get too much into it, let's talk a little bit about what React Native is. So there are loads and loads of different ways to program um, like an app, like lots. Um, here are just a few that I've, that I've laid out over there. Um, React Native, like it, it works all over the place. So, so, so that's pretty cool. I'll get more into the individual comparisons a little bit later on. But basically, it's a way to support multiple applications using a kind of web um, skill set. The basic premise of React Native is that you learn it once, you run it anywhere. And that's great. Like, I learned the skill set for web, and that was fun. And I'm like, cool, I can just take the same skill set and transplant it and use it on native and have an app winning. So that's cool. Um, one thing that a lot of people like about it and a lot of people dislike about it is the fact that it hooks into your device's um, native visual layer. So what that means is that if you make a button in React Native, it's a native button. It's not like a picture of a native button, it's actually the button. And so what that means is that you end up with an app that feels really native, which is super cool. Like if that's what you're going for, if you want your app to like your Apple app to feel like an Apple app and your Android app to feel like your, like an Android app, then that's that's quite a winner. But then it also doesn't allow certain things that the native layer would usually allow. Um, native visual layer would usually allow. So for example, SVGs um, suck. <laughs> like you can't. Um, then um, like also if you wanted to do some drastic um, like changes to how something looks, it's really difficult. Like, I want a unicorn button. Why can't I have a unicorn button? Sorry, no, none of that. <laughs> like, it, it, it's not for you. Um, maybe there is a way to do it, but then you'd have to like get down like deep into the native code, like write some Java that makes your, makes your insane button. Yeah, so that's cool. And then, so you specify this native visual layer in JavaScript, um, like in JSX specifically, um, because it's React. Who's used React before, by the way? OK, cool. All right, OK, sweet. So it looks kind of like HTML, but it's like HTML inside JavaScript, and it's weird, but it's really nice once you get used to it. Um, yeah, so basically, you, you specify your layout in this, in this JSX, and then you specify your, and then that gets turned into native components, and then you 
write a bunch of JavaScript to say how these things behave and interact and all of that stuff. And that JavaScript, it, it doesn't get like, like it just executes on the, on the device. So that's pretty cool. Um, but some people worry that it's slow, and in some cases it, it is kind of slow. So on an Android device, your JavaScript will be just in time compiled. So that means it, it can be pretty quick. Apple devices, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't believe React Native can be just in time compiled on, on Apple devices. Um, I think that, well, from the research that I've done, I haven't tried this, um, it seems that you, yeah, there, there just isn't a way, like it's only interpreted, which is a bit slower. But it still works, so that's cool. Um, it's created by the Facebook, and even though the Facebook is kind of creepy, they're, they're tech, the, the technologies that they produce are really like quite nifty, so that's, that's quite nice. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> it was initially released a couple of years ago, but its first stable release was in September, like five minutes ago. So it's... So I, I think that a lot of <laughs> what has happened with, like, uh, so a lot of people have complained about React Native being difficult in different ways and buggy in different ways, but I think it's because it hasn't been stable until just now. So that's, that's just a point. Um, yeah, so let me, so now I'm just going to show you, like, how React Native compares to other options. So if you have a React background already, it makes sense to reuse the skill set, but like maybe you maybe you don't have a React background, maybe you have an Angular background, or maybe you, you like C Sharp. So there's a whole lot of different things that you can choose from. Um, the first choice is um, between something like React Native and something like just pure old-fashioned native. So one of the cool things about React Native, of course, is that you can have one code base and run it on multiple devices, so this works for Apple and for Android, same code base to an extent. Um, whereas instead you could, of course, just like write some, some Apple code in like Swift or Objective-C, um, probably Swift, and then you can write some um, Android code in Kotlin or Java, but probably Kotlin. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and this is great and it's solid, um, but at, and you'll have something that is really, really fast in the end of, at the end of the day, like your, your app will be speedy because it's close to the machine, it's close to the metal. Um, but you, to get this fast runtime, you get slow dev time. So multiple code bases is a pain in the neck. I heard an interesting um, stat just now. I've been, like, I've been fishing <laughs> in the, in the um, conference for tidbits about, <laughs> about people's experiences with these technologies. I was um, fishing just now, and somebody gave me an interesting stat, which sounds pretty reasonable. Um, say you're developing an Android app, and you, and you do it in like Kotlin um, versus versus React Native, chances are the React Native app will be like half the dev time. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And then, of course, if you need to do React Native versus, uh, you know, like Swift and Kotlin, then that's really awful. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, like two dev teams, two bug lists, like, oh, uh, terrible, terrible. So don't do that unless you actually have to. Um, then there's this other thing called Flutter, which seems really, really cool. It seems very well loved. Um, Stack Overflow says that people love it. I haven't used it myself. Its language is Dash, um, which again, I haven't used before. And it's made by Google. And Google's also kind of creepy, but they seem to be creepy in a nice way. So that's, <laughs> I think I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, yeah, I haven't used this. It, it, it also hasn't, like it, it has, it doesn't do native components, it kind of draws a picture and then you interact with the picture, something like that. Um, but it, it sounds pretty cool. Um, then Xamarin is the old kid on the block. Xamarin's been around for a long time, it's written in C Sharp and owned by Microsoft. Um, it's also cross-platform. Cross um, I don't know how their visual layer works. Um, it's compiled though, which makes it maybe faster on, on iOS um, and it's open source. I don't believe it always was open source, but a lot of like a lot of big companies rely on this technology. So apparently, it's quite solid. So that's like an option as well. Um, then there's something called a PWA. Who's heard of a PWA? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so PWA is a progressive web app, and these things are really, really awesome as well because it walks like an app, it quacks like an app, but it's a website. So that means you host it like a website, but when you open it up on your phone or your tablet, it looks like an app, it feels like an app. Um, the visual layer is 
is a web browser. Um, but you can access native capabilities through this web browser. For example, like the camera, I think also the fingerprint reader, stuff like that. So it's pretty awesome. Um, but it only, you can only access what is exposed to you. You can't just like access the alarm manager, which I needed to do. So I was like, I want to do a PWA. Uh, like I couldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, and then the last kit on the block is Ionic. Well, there's a lot more actually, but this is the last one I'm going to talk about. Who's heard of Ionic? Yeah. Okay, cool. So Ionic, I didn't even consider it in the beginning because I was like, damn, it's, it's Angular. I don't like Angular. Um, like I, I used to use Angular a long time ago, and then I tried React, and I was like, this is just so much nicer to work with. So, so I didn't want to go back to that. And then how Ionic works is it has, it feels kind of like a PWA when I exp explain it, because it's a web view, and your app visual layer runs inside this web view, and then you write some JavaScript, and it also runs, and then the JavaScript can call native components through this thing called Cordova, which is like, a bridge between your JavaScript and your and your actual device. So that's quite cool, but apparently Cordova is kind of a, a pain to write code for. I haven't personally done it, but I've heard a lot of people complain that like it's just like not that easy to get started with it. So I see some nodding. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I'm not even gonna consider Ionic. I'm gonna move on and get, get cracking. So getting started with React Native. There's two different ways to do it. Um, the one is called Expo, and the other one is called the React Native CLI. Um, Expo is easy. Expo is easy peasy, but it's kind of a bit slow. Um, so basically, um, here are four lines of code. This is how you get started with React Native. This kind of spins up a project, and then you can start your project, and life is good. Um, there's this app called Expo that you put on your phone. You snap a, snap a QR code, and you can get cracking. So Okay, I'm going to see at the end how much time there is, and then I can demonstrate this as well as some other stuff. Do you guys want to see it? Who wants to see it? Want to see it? Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, your, your um, argument has convinced me. Sweet. Um. <laughs> okay, cool. So this is, whoa, something weird is happening over there, but let's ignore that. So this is... <laughs> Yeah, a little secret. So this is um, this is a, an Expo app. I, I just made it. Like it's, I haven't done anything to this. I've just done the first couple of commands and I've opened it in an editor. Like I didn't want to do it live because then we'd be sitting here waiting for a download. Um, and then I just say npm start over here. Npm start, and then it starts up, and then it does something like this, which is very exciting. And then in my phone, let me actually go over here. Okay. Oh no, it has. It seems to have broken. Sorry. Okay. One and two. One six eight. Ah, come on. It was working five minutes ago, you guys. I swear. <laughs> Like it really was. <laughs> Damn. Okay, I'll try to show it to you later. But pretty much you can npm start and then you just have it running on your phone. And it's pretty straightforward if you don't have to screencast it. You can pass my phone around maybe later. <laughs> if you guys are like, nice. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's get rid of that. Wow. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Okay, so. Just try it. It's super easy. You just like open up a command line and type in those four commands, and you'll have an Expo app up and running. And Expo is really cool because it makes it that that easy. Um, you can just start changing your code and like changing um, your React Native code, and it'll update on your phone after a while. And then when you mess up, it'll give you this obscure error message that you need to really like think hard to to figure out sometimes. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, like when I when I got started with with React, there were some teething problems. I admit because it's not really learn once, run everywhere. Because there's there's more to React Native than React. Um, yeah, so it's got a couple of cons. The first one is that Expo is really really slow. Um, so if you're running stuff on your phone, for example, um, which is kind of the easy thing to set up, then you make a change and it, it loads for like a while, and then 
and then you get it. Um, you get your response. So it's like it just it just takes a while to 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 dev. Um, alternatively, you can use like you can use an emulator or you can attach your physical device to your computer um, that works as well but it's not like this is not that nice it's not as nice as working in a browser um, then there's this other thing called the react native cli which is cool and um, android studio is kind of a mission to set up but you kind of you, you have to if you want to make like an apk or deploy your stuff to the app store but that's okay um, expo and react native command line interface like they're both good um, Expo makes a lot of things easy, but it makes some things impossible. Um, so I actually had to go with React Native CLI myself, um, which is weird. Um, I mentioned the error messages already. So basically we have React, and that's being run by this thing, which is run by this thing, which is run by this thing, which and eventually the error messages are, are just a little bit un like unintuitive, because the, the signal to noise ratio is just like awful. Um, so I've had a couple of things where it's just like, I, like where do I even look and <laughs> Google the thing? Um, it, it's, it's challenging. Um, and because I came from React, I'm, I'm quite used to just dealing with a browser. Like dev tools in a browser are really, really nice. So I was spoiled. And then like all that stuff that made me like actually fast at React, uh, like those things were gone. And so, yeah, it just became a lot less fun to work with than what I was used to. So that was kind of annoying. Um, okay, we spoke about that one already. Cool. And then came Linux Conf, <laughs> right? So, um, just so <laughs> yeah. So, so in order to like have this talk, I was like, I, I can't just come here with my biases and say React Native is the way to go because React is cool and Angular is crappy and and you should totally use this tool set and blah blah blah. I wanted to give you guys like a super balanced opinion and a useful opinion that you could take take home with you, put it in your pocket. And next time you want to work on a mobile app, you can not just base your stuff on my biased opinions. And so I went out on this mission to debias myself, and and that I did. And so iconic. Like, I didn't want to use Iconic before because it's freaking Angular, damn. But it got a remix, like, like quite a big one. It got a rewrite. So there's this thing called Ionic 4. Um, Ionic 4 has, um, so, so I almost renamed my, my whole talk, but um, I just, we've changed it here. Um, getting started with React <laughs> on native <laughs> with Ionic 4. So basically, um, Basically, Ionic 4 has been dubbed Ionic for everyone. And what's really, really nice about it is that it relies on modern web standards. So it uses, it uses web components, which is fairly newish. I don't actually know when they were introduced, but most like modern browsers run it. So that's great. Um, and that means that it's, it's more tied to web standards than Angular standards. So like, it can still run, run Angular. Wonderful. So the people who are used to that Ionic life, like, they can still do their thing, and it's cool. Um, but it can also run React. It can also run Vue. Um, it can also run just plain old JavaScript. So if there's another framework that comes out, you can probably just use it, and it'll work fine. <coughs> it runs in a browser as well. So by default, like you can use your Chrome developer tools until you start interacting with native components. So that's quite nice because it means like you're nice and fast, and you're you're used to. Um, like you get to use the tools that you're used to as like somebody with web development skills. So that's awesome. Um, and then this one is like, it was quite shocking to me. Um, so I, I had this like React Native CLI app that I'd made and I turned it into an APK and it was like 47 megabytes. And then I made like a similar app with Ionic and it was 6.12 megabytes. And that's like shocking actually. <laughs> like I was like, crap. Um, so, so I, I run it. I work at this like code school, and everybody's got crappy Androids. And I've been thinking about all the nice apps that I can build for these people. And I was like, a 47 megabyte app, like it's not going to fly. They're going to have to do uninstall their Domino's Pizza app, and they're just not going to do that for me. Um, they don't like me that much. They kind of like me, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Then um, they've installed. Uh, there's this new thing called Capacitor as well, which is like it kind of has a similar niche to Cordova, um, except it's 
built specifically around usability. Like they, they really wanted to make it easy to build plugins for this thing. So again, personally, I haven't made any plugins for this thing, but the fact that they're like designing for, de for developer convenience means that the plugins that exist for Capacitor, like there will be more and it'll be easier to make them. So I expect that that, that ecosystem will increase in size, in size. It's also backwards compatible with Cordova. So just like a little refresh, that's the layer between your JavaScript and your metal. Um, so that's awesome. So yeah, that, that's all very, very exciting. And this one, I can show you how to, like even if the phone mirroring screen thing isn't working, like it's, it's quite easy to, to get this up and running because it works in a browser. So, um, uh, what was the command again? Let's see. <laughs> Cool. Ionic serve. And in theory, I wonder what's going on. Okay, winning. Sweet. The world is your oyster. So, what you can do now is rapidly prototype your front end in your browser and then test it out on your phone. You can get it running on your phone and your browser at the same time, which is also really cool, or even multiple devices and your browser at the same time. Um, you're also not limited at all in terms of where this thing can run. So, well, there's always a limitation, but I mean, you can make a desktop app with this and it'll just work. So you can run Electron. Who's heard of Electron? Awesome. So yeah, Electron is like, like a website that looks like a desktop app. So um, who's heard of Slack? Slack, yeah, so Slack, I believe, is an Electron app. Stand to be corrected. Okay, cool. Um, I'm not gonna show you my Slack messages. I'm just gonna be angry and red right now because I haven't been at the office all day. <laughs> yeah, so, so then, like, when I got all this news about Ionic 4, I was like, oh, should I keep it a secret so I can keep my, keep my talk well behaved and on topic? And I figured, like, let me, like if I were if I was personally to start another React um, like native development thing, I would probably do it in Ionic. It just seems like for me a much less like like a more fun experience and also a more um, like it seems very very malleable, which is nice. Um, the one major con of Ionic, however, is the fact that it is a website. So I was talking about um, how React Native is kind of. Like, it's hard to change what the visual layer looks like sometimes. Like, you can't make your unicorn button. You can easily do that with Ionic um, because it's just a website. But the problem with that is that it's very hard to make it look and feel very native. Um, there's probably tips and tricks and tools that are around, but it's not, like, immediately possible. You have to jump through some hoops to do that. So that could be annoying. Um, but regardless, I'd probably, I'd probably go with Ionic. Um, and what's interesting as well is that like React Native has this thing like learn once, run anywhere. But it's kind of hard to just reuse that code as is in, in different platforms. Um, like I've, I've found it difficult anyway. Um, whereas with Ionic, it's, it's much more webby. So it's just like once it's done, you can compile it to different things. Um, with React Native, if you want to do something interesting with, the, with like your components and that hierarchy of, of visual stuff, it's, it's not portable. This is like you're writing stuff for Android now, and now you're writing stuff for, for iOS, whereas web's web's web, so that's nice and easy. Um, yeah. So web keeps changing like every five minutes, and mobile dev keeps changing with it. And so I was thinking like, what happens next? And I've got a theory. I, I suspect some people in this room might, might disagree drastically with my theory, which I'm ready for. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but so I kind of, I started looking around and Google Trends isn't like the best, it's not like the truth of the popularity of a language or a framework, but I was looking at React, Angular, Vue, the big three, and how, how curious people are about these things, right? And curiosity is probably, like there's a correlation between curiosity and awesomeness. There must be. <laughs> so. So um, React is like the most awesome, um, or the world thinks it's the most awesome for now. Um, and then Vue is like behind it, but it's kind of catching up and sometimes overtaking it. So Vue's really worth looking at. And then at the bottom here, we have Angular. And Angular is consistently like 
half as awesome as React. And so we probably don't want to use that. Um, but then, if you look at Ionic versus React Native, it's like React Native doesn't even feature, um, which is amazing. It's weird. Like it's, it's strange to me that that's the case, because I know for a fact that there are like some pretty big players using React Native. Let's take the Facebook as an example, but also like a lot of, I believe there's a bunch of corporates in South Africa that use it, and, and we're South Africa, so we're a little bit old school sometimes. Um, but yeah, so so it seemed like this this difference is really drastic, and this difference is well, this difference is really drastic, and it makes me feel like maybe React just gonna get completely squashed by Angular Bionic now, just because like now all of the React stuff can work here, and there's so many skills here already, and so many people think it's awesome already. So it makes me really wonder about the future of of React Native. Um, yeah. So so that's that. Um, yeah, I like to introduce myself at the end of talks because then you know if you should pay attention or not. So, I, my name is Sheena. That that's not a picture of me. That's a picture of where I work, um, <laughs> sort of. Um, so I'm I'm the CTO of Umuzi. Um, we do learnerships. So we take high potential individuals and we train them up and we get them into good jobs. Um, we teach them web dev, data science, data engineering, and a bunch of other things. So that's kind of how I spend my days. Have a couple of students at the back here. Hi guys. Yay. <laughs> Behind the camera. <laughs> awesome. Um, and we're hiring. So if you want to come help out, then let me know. Um, yeah. And then, because I'm all about that education life, here's a couple. Here are a couple of resources that you guys can use. You can download these slides. They're like it's it's a GitHub site, so it's just available. So you can like if you want to get into this, you just learn these things in this kind of order, and you should do okay. Um, and then, yeah, um, you can scan that if you want to have the presentation, or just there it is. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it from me. I could either, okay, let's take a vote. I can either show you guys some code, or I can take some questions, or both. Who wants questions? Okay. All right. Who wants code? <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. It's about okay. Cool. So, like, I, I can show some like basic React. Is that what you guys want? Awesome. How are we doing for time? Okay. Okay. Cool. Awesome. I can maybe do both. So, oops. Uh, all right, so this is my expo app, uh, not expo at all. This is, okay, this is my, my Ionic app, right? And if you've never worked with React before, um, then this might be interesting. If you have worked with React before, then this might be boring. Um, but let's say, um, let's get rid of that stuff and say, the oyster is your world. Save that and fix that and go back here and wonderful. So it just updates. And if you're running it on your phone, it just updates like also really, really quickly. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, remind me again, who, who has seen React before and who hasn't? You, you ha okay, who has? Okay, cool. And the rest of you, do you want to know a little bit about what makes React cool? Yeah? Okay, awesome, awesome. So basically, um, this is a TypeScript file, but it says TSX. Um, who's heard of TypeScript? Okay, cool. For those of you who haven't, you've heard of JavaScript. TypeScript is JavaScript with types. Um, so it's just a bit stricter. Um, so you can have a React application that's running in just JavaScript, but um, when you start your Ionic thing, it starts in TypeScript, uh, which is okay. Um, so a lot of what you see here will, will just look kind of JavaScript-y, like you're importing some stuff, and then you're exporting some stuff, but then you have this weird function over here, and it returns something that looks like HTML. This is the X part of TSX, and it would be the X part of JSX if you're writing this stuff in JavaScript. So like the internet is weird, um, and web pages are weird. Like the first web pages were like HTML, and that was pretty ugly. And then there was this um, 
And then people started attaching like styles to their HTML to say like, make this one blue and add a border over there and blah, blah, blah. And so you ended up having like this information and your kind of color by numbers attached to the information. And then everybody thought that that was bad practice. And now there's like CSS and HTML. And then like you can attach some like interactions straight to your HTML as well, or you can put it in a separate script. And in general, like the trend was to move towards separating these things out. Like your HTML lives here, your JavaScript lives here, your CSS lives here. React says like, mm -mm, let's put them back together again, um, but in this unique and special way. So basically what you can do in React is have, um, let's just say, you can have variables and functions and whatnot, and you can call them straight from inside the H from inside your HTML stuff, um, which is interesting. So I can say like var yo um, equals well, let's do const yo because that is better practice. I don't really do TypeScript very much, so let's see. Um, and I'm just gonna take that and I'm gonna put it over there. Um, yo, save that and go back here and s Linux conf, right? So you can call, like, you can just like plug your, plug your vari variables in there. Thank you. Um, you can plug your um, functions in there. Your functions can return other like HTML thingies and then those will arrive. You can put those in loops. So you can do all sorts of nifty things. Um, yeah, I think since there's only 10 minutes left, we can maybe talk about React later if anybody's curious, but let's see what questions there are and if I can answer them. Yeah, questions? Yeah? Um, so with Bionic 4, it's still basically uh, running in a web view kind yeah. of thing. It's not yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's for the camera as well. That you've so with um, Ionic 4, it's still running your app as a web view. There's no, you're not running native components. Yeah, yeah, still, so still in a web view. But um, one of the cool things about Ionic 4 um, is that on Apple devices, it can be just in time compiled, but with the React Native, it can't be. So it's still in a web view, but it might actually be faster on Apple. I'm not sure, I haven't measured it, but um, yeah. Um, anyone else? <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> You wouldn't have had a problem getting to your uh, alarm clock settings with the iconic stuff. You can still get there via capacitor and yeah, yeah. and no worries with that sort of thing. Yeah, it's it's all fine because like you getting to connect Bluetooth and stuff like that. Yeah, you can connect like you can write some some Java code and get capacitor to, to run that. I assume it also does Kotlin, but I haven't tried. But I've seen some like Java examples. Um, so if it's exposed on your device, then you can use it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. It's intense because I'm right by the microphone. At least it's not <laughs> all the speakers. It's not feeding. Oh. Um, have you looked at, at trusted web activities at all? No, I haven't. Because the use case that you said, like the alarm clock, right? Mm. There wasn't really a cross-platform app. It was always going to be Android specific, right? Uh, yeah, it, it was in this case, yeah. So a trusted web activity could have been cool because it's um, basically wrapping a PWA inside an APK. So you can just use Java or Kotlin to access the alarm manager stuff, and everything else is just a normal website. That's pretty awesome. I mm. didn't know about that at all. That's yeah. So if, but obviously that's Android only. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Yeah. It's like a lag. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think any of your bias came from the fact that you'd done all the React stuff before you went to look at the Iconic stuff? Yes, definitely. So I, you came yeah. back and uh, Iconic was actually, Ionic was easier because you'd already done that spin up for the React. Yeah, well, I think Ionic was just easy by default. Um, and if I came from Angular, it is where I would have looked first. Um, it would have been the first choice. My, my bias came in from like my initial thought was just like, I only can't do what I want because I want to use this, this skill set. Um, 
but then like once I saw that Ionic could handle the things that I wanted, I've, like I looked into it and I was like, is there in fact a reason that I can see for using React Native over Iconic for a new project? And I just like couldn't find one. Just I, Ionic, I keep saying Iconic. This is how new I am to it. Damn, it's embarrassing. Um, but, but Ionic is like, um, like it just seemed to win on every, every mention, like everything I looked up, it just seemed to win, yeah. Like I don't know if you can do a React Native Electron application. I think you can't, but I'm not sure. You can't. Okay, I see. Microsoft is working on something. Okay, okay, that's cool. Sorry, I missed most of this, but uh, from personal pains and battle scars with Ionic, would you say it's better to stick to React Native? Because it seems to, even though React's moving fast and that whole ecosystem, it seems to have a much better backwards compatibility than Ionic. I mean, not that I think capacitor is not a good idea, it's just what would happen in Ionic 5 and 6, and then you constantly have to re-engineer everything, especially the routing, whoever's using that. It's it's just a bit of a pain to keep up at the moment. Okay. Um, is it better at the React Native side? I... Honestly, I don't have enough experience to say for sure, but I can tell you what I've read. So, Capacitor is supposed to be very, very much um, compatible with Cordova. So, you shouldn't have, it's supposed to be backwards compatible. Like, you shouldn't have to redo stuff. Even the, the team who's working on Capacitor, they're making some Cordova plugins and they're like, yeah, it's fine. We're making them there. So, people are using them now in their older apps, but it'll be available when we switch to Capacitor as well. So, I'm not sure, like, maybe there will be some teething problems, but I, I, it sounds like they're being very thoughtful about that transition. And then around, like Ionic versioning itself, um, the fact that it's Ionic 4, I mean, the fact that Ionic 4 is web components means that your Angular code should just work, um, which is nice. Or so if you wanted to move to that from like an earlier version, your, like the code that you wrote should just work. Um, you might need to, yeah, like I, I'm not sure, maybe the structure of the of the project will be slightly different but, and you'll just need to move stuff around and reference it in a different way. But it it seems to me that if the if the Cordova slash um, capacitor layer is same, same, and the web layer is just like really malleable, it seems like moving there won't be such a big deal. I might be wrong. I might be terribly wrong. Yeah, <laughs> it's possible. Um, any other questions? Um, with the popularity of WebAssembly rising, 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 and I mean Qt recently um, included WebAssembly to be able to compile from their C++ code base, and I can run an essentially native applications in the web. Do you think somehow Android or iOS is going to do a similar thing where you can run the native Java code in the web browser? You don't need any of these capacitors or um, Cordova layers, and it essentially just plugs in straight to the native metal of the hardware? I, I don't think so. Mike knows. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I could only guess, <laughs> but let's get a real answer. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm curious as well. <laughs> okay, so um, there's an interesting misconception about WebAssembly there, right? Because the, the where WebAssembly would run, run is still in the web sandbox. So you still wouldn't have access to the native APIs. Mm. So that's never going to change. I was going to guess that, just okay. for the record. <laughs> for the record, you would have been correct. <laughs> so, so like Qt compiling to um, WebAssembly and running Qt in the browser just seems like the worst of all worlds, right? Because now you've got Qt instead of HTML. Like, but it, it still doesn't give you any, any elevated privileges. Awesome. I think it is one minute to go, so I can maybe have one more question. If it's a rapid fire. <coughs> it's a wild one, but considering that we've got some interesting questions, has anyone seen GPU.js used on uh, any of the native frameworks? No. What is that? It's a JavaScript library that allows you to, to actually hook into your GPU. break down functions and send it to the GPU and get a response back. But even on a browser, I've seen it kill my machine, so I'm wondering <laughs> if a phone can actually handle it. I haven't seen that, but I have seen TensorFlow.js on, a f I think it was on a phone, um, which is interesting because that hooks into the GPU as well, 
which is really cool, because TensorFlow is actually a Python library, but the Python version can only work on certain GPUs, and the JavaScript version works on just, like, whatever. Um, so GPU processing from JavaScript seems like a really, really cool thing, but that specific use case, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, Mike says it's because JavaScript is better. I don't know. I like Python. I actually really like Python. Damn. <laughs> okay. Cool. I, I what they're trying to do is because JavaScript. Sorry. Is, I think what they're trying to do with it because JavaScript is essentially single-threaded. You can like if you're doing a game, especially in JavaScript, you could um, offset some of the calculations in the GPU and just get it later. So. That's quite nice. I haven't, I haven't used it myself, so I can't really say. It, it just seems like such a good idea because you're not doing OpenCL to get to the GPU on the yeah. phone. It's just JavaScript. Just fire it off and get something back. Yeah, that sounds, sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> I'm closing the laptop. <laughs> Don't worry, assistance, but let's have a... No, no, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>